Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming. It's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Lisa Diamond. Um, Dr. Diamond is a professor of psychology and gender studies here at the University of Utah. She received her doctorate from, in human development from Cornell University in 1999. Dr. Diamond's research focuses on adolescent and young adult social and sexual development and on the psychobiological mechanisms through which intimate relationships influence physical and mental health over the course of life. Dr. Diamond is particularly interested in the longitudinal course of sexual identity development and multi multiple environmental and psychosocial factors that influence the emergence and expression of sexual and affectionate feelings for same-sex and other sex partners at different stages of life. Dr. Diamond is perhaps best known for her unprecedented research uh, which is a longitudinal study of 100 lesbian, bisexual, heterosexual, and unlabeled women, whom she has been doing uh, regular interviews with since 1995, tracking changes in their sexual identities, attractions, and behaviors over time. Her 2008 book, Sexual Fluidity, published by Harvard University Press, uh, describes the changes and transformations that her respondents underwent from late adult adolescence to adulthood and has been awarded a Distinguished Book Award from the American Psychological Association Society for the Study of LGBT uh, Issues. Dr. Diamond has received numerous awards for her work. In 2011, she was granted the uh, Fellow of Status uh, in APA's Division of, for the Psychological Study of Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Issues. She has been awarded grants in, su in support of her research from the National Institute for Mental Health, WT Grant Foundation, the American Psychological Foundation, the American Institute for Bisexuality, and the Temple Templeton Foundation. So without any more ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Lisa Diamond. Uh, and specifically with the way in which 
traditional, patriarchal, extremely conservative religious groups and communities, the ones that are, you know, most stridently talking about immorality and homosexuality, the way in which those groups and those communities have in fact succeeded in defining the debate about same-sex marriage in a way that, you know, you know, queers have sort of gone along with it in terms of agreeing that there is a certain model of marriage and family that we should all be ascribing to, and that it's our similarity with that model that actually grants us legitimacy uh, as, as families and societies. I'm, I'm in trouble by the degree to which members of the LGBT community, instead of saying, how dare you define what a moral family looks like, have instead been followed over one another to say, oh, no, no, look, we're just like you. We fit that model, too. We want exactly the same thing you do. And that's the basis on which uh, we deserve our rights. That's the, the sort of strategic approach to same-sex marriage that, that, that I find troubling that I want to critique today. So my goal is to raise some critical questions, not about the goal of marriage equality, which I fully endorse, but the strategies that the LGBT and progressive communities have started to use to achieve that goal in the face of the conservative religious opposition to that goal. Uh, and before I, wanna, before I begin, I want to be clear that I know fully well that there are very many religious communities and faith traditions that support the goal of marriage equality, and there are plenty of atheists oppose the goal of marriage equality, so I'm not making some tight equivalence between uh, you know, religious identification and, and support for opposition for same-sex marriage. Uh, but I am focusing specifically on the way that debate has been framed in this country over the past five to ten years, in which there has been a very active, vehement opposition to same-sex marriage in a very particular faith tradition, a sort of conservative, true Christian, a uh, far right uh, religious community, the sort of Bible Belt, uh, you know, uh, type of religious faith. So that's the particular faith tradition that, that I'm talking about in particular. It's certainly not inclusive of, of all religious opposition to same-sex marriage, but that's the way the political debate has been framed. Uh, and certainly anyone who follows the uh, the, uh, the political primaries and follow the Republican primary in any details will realize that that is a, an extremely politically powerful uh, part of, of our culture right now, and, and it still has a lot of influence on the Republican Party in particular, but on the politics around this issue um, in general. Um, I also, you know, want to state in terms of full disclosure that I married my own partner in a completely non-legal. A uh, proto Jewish ceremony here in Salt Lake City <laughs> 10 years ago. Um, I was raised by a Southern Baptist and an atheist. My partner was raised a conservative Jew. So we were married by a formerly Jewish universal life minister uh, <laughs> in front of his backyard you know, under a kopa. So, you know, I, I'm completely down with the complicated status that marriage has as a state of legal recognition that, that I don't and as a, a, a type of union that has cultural significance, community significance, certainly when my partner and I decided to get married, we knew that there were no legal cookies that were attached to it in the state of Utah. So it was purely a personal decision made you know, with respect to our families and our communities. And, and that's part of the complicated nature of this debate, right? That marriage is not simply a legal status. It has a cultural meaning and a, and a cultural status, which is why it becomes a unit, you know, target of all this opposition. Um, so, as someone who is non legally married, to someone who is religiously identified, uh, I still want to raise some suspicions about the ways in which the debates about same-sex marriage and the gay community's advocacy for same-sex marriage has ended up actually shoring up some rather conservative, rather patriarchal, uh, frankly, dangerous notions about the inherent wonderfulness and healthfulness of traditional patriarchal, Judeo-Christian, nuclear family structures. Uh, and that advocacy, I think, has functioned quite perniciously to motivate queers like me to end up actually conforming to that model of family functioning and by the same token demonstrating just how deserving we are of marriage rights on the basis of our conformity 
conformity with that very familiar model. I mean, this is a classic case in which the dominant social order manages to successfully reproduce itself by enlisting those who would normally critique it in the project of actually ending up supporting and sustaining its norms and its standards for acceptable behavior. I think the most obvious example of this can be seen whenever you turn on the television and you find folks, you know, profiling gay couples who want to get married, and there are all these public education campaigns and these visibility initiatives. And what you find is that they sort of trumpet just how similar uh, gay couples are to heterosexual couples. And as a relationship researcher, I know that, that they are, in fact, very similar to heterosexual couples in a lot of ways, uh, and how kind of non-threatening they are. And so the sorts of couples that you see uh, in these public advocacy campaigns, you know, they, they, they're very conservatively dressed, and there's no, not, not too much affection, there's no hint of anything sexual between them. They're like, you know, they've been together for 30 years and have a, a completely sexless marriage. <laughs> and ideally, you know, they're, they, you know, there's like a, you know, a, a cross somewhere in the background, and they're, they've got a child, some beautiful child that, you know, they're, they're sending to the Hebrew school or something. Uh, and they'll say things like, well, oh, I'm, I'm not one of those flag wavers. I, I don't march in any parades. Um, I'm just trying, you know, just trying to live our lives and kind of protect our families and blah, 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 blah. Now, I want to be clear, I'm nothing wrong with those families. I kind of, you know, me and my partner and, and our boring, you know, monogamous intermarriage, we, we look like some of those families too. What I'm concerned with is the, is the very strategic deployment of those very non-threatening, traditional-seeming same-sex couples as a piece of ammunition in the same-sex marriage debate as if the only way we could win the moral argument for the legitimacy of same-sex relationships is to say, look, you're right, the only couples who are deserving of legal protections are these very non-threatening, traditional couples who adhere to all your moral values, and look, we look just like that, and so therefore uh, we need those rights. Now, that strategy has been hugely effective. We know from polling that individuals who support same-sex marriage tend to agree with statements like same-sex couples are, you know, equivalent to heterosexual couples in almost every way. They agree with statements like same-sex marriage doesn't threaten the social order. Same-sex marriage doesn't threaten the institution of uh, marriage. Uh, God loves all individuals. Gay is great. A gay relationship can be sanctified just as much as a heterosexual relationship. Great. Right, super. You know, my problem is that there's an inherent implication in those strategies and in, in arguments that sort of trump at those equivalencies that same-sex relationships deserve protection because of our similarities in heterosexual relationships and our, and our familiarity with respect to a certain model of traditional marriage and family. Uh, every time we say, wow, look how similar to heterosexual couples we are, how can you possibly deny us our rights? We're basically agreeing with the premise that traditional heterosexual coupledom and the sort of traditional Judeo-Christian patriarchal marriage and family structure is the best relationship and family system that exists and that we all should, in fact, aspire to be that. And frankly, those of us like myself who as feminists have spent years questioning the helpfulness of traditional marriage and the helpfulness of traditional patriarchal family structures should be really ambivalent about colluding with the notion that similarity to that model uh, is the basis on which we demonstrate our worthiness uh, as citizens and as human beings. It's true that there are a lot of similarities between same-sex and heterosexual couples, uh, but that is not the basis on which we deserve legal protections uh, for our relationships. Um, couples that you know have the you know the, the sort of traditional lifestyle, you know, monogamous, and they've got the one kid, and they attend church, and they, they look you know very traditional, uh, are not more deserving of basic legal protections for their relationships than a same-sex couple who is not monogamous, and a same-sex couple that is childless, and a same-sex couple that is atheist. Uh, it's a deep and important problem, I think, that is a drive to show just how similar we are to, to <coughs> heterosexual couples. The gay communities ended up actually throwing a lot of members of our community under the bus. Uh, and we've made it politically dangerous 
for queers and for feminists to do the important work that we've done for many years of questioning the fact that we still dole out in this country basic legal protections on the basis of adhering to a very traditional conservative patriarchal model of marriage and family and citizenship more generally. Uh, we're colluding with an approach that says our rights as couples and families are actually conditioned upon conforming with that model. I think it's a very short step from saying that we're just like you and we deserve our rights to uh, we deserve our rights as long as we are just like you. Uh, so in other words, it sort of splits the world up into different types of gays. There are the good gays uh, who deserve acceptance and legal protection because they look and act and smell just like heterosexuals and they believe in God and they, they're sending their kids to good private schools and they're nice and quiet and unassuming and non threatening. And then there are the bad gays, like the promiscuous gays, the flag waving gays, the agitators, the gender queers, the atheists, the polyamorous folks. Uh, and I would like to find a way to advocate for the of our lives and our families that does not go along with that sort of devil's bargain that splits up in the community into the deserving and the non-community, uh, the non-deserving, and that doesn't end up helping the patriarchy to enforce a certain set of oppressive standards about what counts as a legitimate and healthy family. Um, I'm not willing for us to sort of gain marriage rights um, at the expense of a critique of a social system that posits that the best and most valuable, most meaningful individuals in our society have the following characteristics. One, their most significant adult relationship is formed with a romantic and sexual partner. Two, that that partnership is sexually and emotionally monogamous, which you can't have more than one. Three, that that relationship lasts forever. You know, so you better meet the right person, you know, soon. Um, or that that partnership requires sharing a home, uh, sharing a single residence together. Five, that that partnership involves the rearing of children. And six, and this you know, part would be considered optional by some, but I think it's relevant to our discussion today, that that partnership is sanctified by God and by members of each individual's uh, you know, faith community. I mean, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like feminists did, did a pretty awesome job back in the 70s uh, in arguing that these were not, in fact, preconditions for living a happy and fulfilling and moral life, that you could be single, that you could be atheist, that you could be childless, you could be promiscuous, uh, and you could still be a worthwhile, respectable, accomplished, uh, moral, and psych you know, psychologically healthy human being. Uh, when it comes to uh, sexual minority individuals, to queer individuals, we're not allowed to have the privilege of being needed. If we want to be accepted and if we want our relationships to be treated with some respect, we have to be relatively docile. We need to have a wedding and a church and a mortgage and children and a baby on the way. And I swear to God, every time I see folks going all boom boom and gaga over lesbian moms and dads and talking about how cool they are and how awesome they are, I just <laughs> and and when I, you know, this is not unrelated to the fact that if you are a lesbian of a certain age, uh, as I am, and you're in a stable relationship and you have a stable job, uh, you're considered like, it's like, why don't you want to have a baby? Now you can have a baby. It's like, oh, the only reason that you weren't having a baby before was because society would let you, but now you can get a star donor and it's so accepting and there's heaven has two mommies. And so the fact that I, my partner and I have chosen not to have babies basically stamps us as selfish, careerist, cold-hearted, you know, uh, um, And, you know, it's like we, we thought that we had this argument, you know, in terms of feminism 20 years ago, but now, heck, even Michelle Obama is saying that her chief job is being mom and chief. So the, the monetocracy is in full force, uh, making sure that women, queer or not, know what our true calling is, and that true calling is to uh, introduce. Um, for me, one of the most powerful uh, motivating aspects of my life as a feminist and a queer activist has been the ability and the importance to challenge conventional assumptions about what healthy families look like, what healthy moral individuals look like. And that critique has tended to be really silenced in a lot of the advocacy for same-sex marriage. Uh, I want us to be able to uh, trumpet the rights of unmarried, unpartnered individuals raising children together, individuals whose primary emotional attachment is not to the sexual partner, is maybe to a friend or a family member, individuals who don't 
want to raise their children to believe in a Godhead, individuals who have more than one romantic and sexual partner, individuals who have chosen not to share a home with their romantic and sexual partner, uh, individuals who uh, are parenting with someone that they're not sexually involved with, uh, individuals who maintain an, an enduring emotional attachment to one another but pursue casual sex outside the relationship, all of those alternative family forms exist. They are, in fact, more common among um, queer individuals and heterosexual identified individuals, largely because our community has supported a lot of experimentation in terms of determining what sort of family forms we want to live with. Uh, and I think that if we're going to advocate for the, you know, the legitimacy, the, the legal and economic legitimacy of our relationships, we have to, to argue the legitimacy of those alternative family forms as well. The reason we don't, right, is because we're afraid that we feed into that anti-gay record. Look, the queers are non-monogamous. They are too interested in sex. They are trying to, uh, you know, destroy the institution of marriage. And uh, in, in my opinion, the LGBT community has been pretty silent in the face of those critiques. We haven't really stood up for alternative family forms. We haven't really taken the most sex-positive approach we could have taken. Uh, we have instead sort of kowtow to that patriarchal religious tradition that says that certain family forms uh, are more deserving than others. Uh, and every time we hear the critique of, oh, you know, gay families threaten the institution of marriage, we say, oh, no, 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 no. don't worry, they don't. Uh, but you know what? They should. And we should. I don't like the institution of marriage. We should challenge and threaten and criticize and wrestle with that institution, especially the form of marriage that conservative religious leaders have still managed to convince us is the right and the best type of marriage. One is patriarchal, one in which men tend to have more power in the home, in the home. one in which women and children are granted second-class status. I don't want to protect that as an institution. I do want to slowly and progressively poison and destroy it. Um, everyone on an individual level has a right to arrange and manage their family ties in whatever way they want, but not to institutionalize that into the legal code as the most deserving form of family, uh, and to therefore communicate that that is the form that our society is going to, to treat as legitimate. I think one of the benefits of same-sex relationships in terms of our status you know, in society is that the simple existence of, of a family like my own poses a challenge to everyone to think about, you know, what are the assumptions that they make about what a normal family looks like uh, and what a, you know, a healthy moral family is. I think gay couples have highlighted in our very existence that there are alternative ways to be human, to do right by our children, to do right by our families, to live a moral life. There's not one way to be a moral and healthy, sanctified individual. Uh, you can love two people and be morally healthy. You can have a series of long-term relationships and a lot of sex on the side and be absolutely as moral and upstanding and deserving of legal protections as someone in a more traditional relationship. Uh, that's why I think we need to fight against the temptation to keep arguing that same-sex couples deserve marriage rights because of our similarity to traditional marriages. Whether we are or not is irrelevant, uh, but frankly the truth is that same-sex couples are a lot different from traditional heterosexual couples. We are less likely to be religiously conservative. We are more likely to be non-monogamous. But you know what? We're also more likely to be equitable. There's more equitable division of household labor in same-sex couples, more equitable division of household finances, more equitable division of childcare. There's more open discussion and negotiation about sexual needs and incompatibilities, and more sexual satisfaction. Uh, individual sexual acts tend to last longer. I've never heard that as an argument for same-sex marriage, but I'm more than <laughs> 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 I'll have sex for a longer period of time. Um, I'm sorry to be commercial about that. <laughs> and although I've never seen a study that explicitly tests this, I would bet a million dollars that there is more planning and negotiation and forethought about the decision to have children in same-sex couples than is the case for heterosexual couples. So I don't want to be pretending that we are so similar to heterosexual couples. I don't really think it's a bad honor, and it's certainly not a basis for civil rights. We deserve respect and rights because we're just autonomous 
citizens of this country and because our choices about life and love and sex are ours to make. Now, let's be clear, you know, part of, of the, the difficulty with even advocating for legal protections for same-sex relationships in general means going along with a social order that does in fact use the legal system and the tax code as a mechanism to encourage and reward certain intimate behaviors and decisions and to discourage and punish others. Now, you know, on a philosophical level, the pragmatic pluses and minuses of that sort of a social system uh, have been debated about, you know, at length, and those are worthwhile debates, and that's a longer discussion we can have today. And in many cases, it's kind of easy to see the benefits. You want more people to donate to charity and make it tax deductible. You want them to buy houses, there's the more big interest deduction, right? You want them to have kids, blah, blah, blah. You see where this goes. So America has this system, and America likes that system, and I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. We're, you know, I think the libertarian, um, you know, agenda is, is not really going to win. But I still think that we should be suspicious of the system when it's applied to our most intimate choices, and when it's applied to an institution that is as steeped in religiosity <coughs> as marriage is. The notion of rewarding legal and financial privileges. Uh, some of the most intimate and private decisions that people make, and specifically rewarding a mode of family practice that is directly linked to religious practice, should give us pause. Queers, of all people, have been powerfully critical of these sorts of mechanisms of social control, and we should continue to be. Now, you know, I'm not naive, I don't think that that's going to change anytime soon. America still wants to dole out financial and legal privileges to individuals who have marriage-type family forms. Fine, you know, that is going to be the way that it works. Let's then work on gaining access to those privileges, as we're doing, by gaining access to marriage rights. But I think we can do that and have that be a part of our agenda while still calling attention to the fact that this is, in fact, a form of social regulation of our intimate laws. Let us continue to talk about that and question that as we still try and protect the legal and the economic status of the relationship. So, to conclude, as I said, I'm all for same sex marriage, raw, raw, raw. I'm in one. I would like it to be recognized and protected. I'm just saying that in our zeal to secure rights and protections for our family, let us not lose sight of the powerful critiques that we should be making of the patriarchal and religiously conservative institution of marriage and the practice of rewarding that specific form of marriage with financial and legal benefits. Let's not drink the Kool-Aid and imagine that the traditional patriarchal, Judeo-Christian family forms are in fact the best and the healthiest and that we should you know, aspire to them. Let's not imagine that it's perfectly natural and wonderful for our government to regulate and enforce our intimate and spiritual lives. And let's not imagine that winning same-sex marriage rights would be the greatest progressive pro-gay victory we could possibly imagine. It probably would not be. Uh, it's complicated. So as we continue to fight for a new equality, let's do so on the basis of basic human dignity, autonomy, and privacy, and not on the basis of our similarity with a model of healthy and moral family that is, in fact, inherently Okay, we'll be taking just a, three or four questions. Um, if, if, you're, if you have another question, please wait until the panel discussion around the quarter after six, in which we'll be asking all three speakers. So I'll be handing this around. Um, she had her hand. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Um, this actually isn't a, uh, just, I guess, the viewpoint of same sex marriage that I've considered before, as far as. Needing to assimilate in order to gain your rights. I can certainly see how that might be beneficial on some level, but as we were speaking, I couldn't help but sit here and draw parallels between various other, let's say, outsider groups who have uh, assimilated into society, say, the Irish when they came over, or uh, African Americans when they first started to gain their rights. And so I'm thinking, what are the pros and cons between? 
perhaps some bit of assimilation under, it's almost like they're icebreakers. You know, people who do want to appear to be more like a standard heterosexual family, nuclear family, are they doing any kind of service by perhaps helping to get gay marriage legalized and then under that umbrella, then you would have more freedom to say, all right, well, you know, it's all right to be married as a gay couple, we have our rights, you cannot discriminate against us because our lifestyle does not look just like this. And I'm wondering, is there any overlap and or convergence between a lot of the, the ground style I see lately in more non-traditional petro couples who are polyamorous or who are non-monogamous? Um, well, I'm just curious because I could be considered a secular, atheist, promiscuous, childless spot. <laughs> 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 well taken that, you know, the, um, it's, and, and as I said, it's certainly clear that by trumpeting these very traditional looking gay couples, the movement for gay marriage has, has gained a lot of ground. Attitudes toward gay marriage have shifted quite dramatically even in the past 20 years. Uh, now the majority of Americans uh, do not oppose gay marriage. I mean, it's still pretty close. It's still hovering around, you know, 45% opposed. But that was flipped over, I mean, even just 20 years ago. Now, how did we make that gain? It's not that a bunch of people were like, wow, polyamory is great, and sex is great, and gay marriage is great too. No, instead, the folks who tended to change their views were the ones who were like, wow, that gay couple down the hall from me, they were just so nice, and I was gay and couple. So the assimilationist strategy works. It's just that it's, a, it's like a short-term, long-term thing. It, it works in the short term in terms of changing attitudes, but it's going to bite us in the ass so hard down the line by basically saying that our rights are conditional on looking a certain way. So I think the strategy that is probably going to be the most effective is the one that is kind of emerging you know, on its own, which is that there's a certain very traditional, you know, human rights campaign, like, look, gay people are just like you. And then underground, there are people like me trying to remind progressives that there's a different way to frame this argument, and that it may take a little bit longer to make that argument. Certainly, I don't think anyone is going to, you know, succeed in fighting the Defensive Marriage Act by arguing for polyamory, right? <laughs> We're not ready for that. But I think that what we're making you know, these more conservative assimilationist gains, we should be doing so sort of with a wink and a nudge, knowing that, okay, this might be a short-term strategy, but the long-term goal is autonomy, is true autonomy. And just arguing that we're just like homosexuals is not consistent with that goal. Um, so, you know, we're just screwed in that way. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Benedict. I wanted to ask you a question. You talk a lot about, you know, same-sex couples that are pretty much like kind of on the higher end of the economic sector of things. But I know a lot of gay couples that are living in poverty, struggling, you know, to, you know, be identified in society and so on and so forth. And you know, my eye, my ears really opened up when we started talking about kind of some of the negative undertones of being in a same-sex relationship, but. I'm wondering if your frame is all about the higher economic end, you know, gay, gay couple, gay advocacy, because that's not the side of gay couples that I see. I think that's a really important point, and I think a, a part of where that becomes relevant is, again, if you think about the way that uh, the advocates for same-sex marriage, the sort of public information campaigns, they, are, they do tend to show a very middle-class notion of marriage. Um, they don't really present a full, and, and it's also a very white perspective that the sorts of couples you see on ads for happy gay couples tend to be white upper middle class families. One of the interesting pieces of information that I only became aware of uh, in the past couple of years, that we, we now have a better census data than we've had available to us for a long time on uh, gay couples. And one of the things that, that has been found, which really blew me out of the water, is that ethnic minority same-sex couples are substantially more likely to be raising children than white same-sex couples. So although we have the stereotype of the cute, 
middle class, white lesbians in San Francisco, raising their kids. That's actually not the norm. Ethnic minority gay families are far more likely to be raising children, and they're substantially more likely to be poor and to be on public assistance. So there's a very powerful critique of traditional family structures and the sort of economic marginalization of same-sex families that's not being made. And yet we have the data that could support that larger critique, and I think that would be a more winning critique to make about the marginalization of gay families, and yet that's an argument that's not being made. So I think that point is well taken, and, and really points to alternative ways that we could make this argument and fight this fight that would really actually include the full diversity of, um, of gay families.